Welcome to the Slow Wine Guide virtual visit for 2021. I'm here with Clark Smith. Clark is a winemaker, consultant, and was voted top, most influential top 40 uh, wine, industry, uh, wine industry folks by Wine Business Monthly a couple years ago. So Clark is with us today. Welcome, Clark. Yeah, and don't forget to plug the book. <laughs> oh, well, we'll let you do that. <laughs> I'll get to it. I'll okay. get to it. It's a very important part of what, what we're doing here. Uh, so I've been in the wine industry since 1972. I've done 58 vintages, uh, 44 of them in the Northern Hemisphere and 14 in the Southern Hemisphere. And uh, uh, now we have this little tiny winery that's about a thousand cases. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you how I got there. It, uh, I built a winery called R.H. Phillips in, uh, in the eighties. And we started out at 3000 cases. We didn't lose money, we made $50,000. We went all the way up to a third of a million cases and we were still making $50,000. So I, then the problem was we didn't know our customers. So uh, we just knew the buyer at Safeway. So I decided to get, to see how small I could get and still make a go of it. And so we have this very tiny winery. There's just three of us. Uh, my wife, Ruthie, does the books. And uh, uh, my assistant winemaker is a gal named uh, Sandra Johnson. And she's probably the one you would talk to if you wanted to, on the phone, if you wanted to buy some of our wine. Uh, we, uh, we do almost all of our business online, uh, which made it much easier for us to, uh, uh, to adapt to the new situation. It was really what we were doing all along anyway. And we like to make videos and, you know, taste the wines with, with each other and talk about them. And, and so we, we really were sort of geared for that. We're really, really lucky. We don't have a Room. Uh, the reason we don't have a tasting room, we're right downtown Santa Rosa, but uh, wines and taste the wine and buys it because it's not a typical kind of situation. So, right. So, uh, what year did you found your your current winery, Wine Smith? Nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety. Okay. Great. Yeah, and we've always been tiny. Uh, our, uh, what we're up to, uh, well, two things. One is to provide what we call affordable profundity. So one of the ones we're gonna taste today, you know, I make a $275 Napa Cabernet. This stuff is almost as good and it's, and it's 60 bucks. So, and, and you know, I have to tell you that me and my colleagues, uh, and, I, and I'm talking about 10,000 winemakers out there, uh, many of which I know very well. And I'll tell you two things about them. One of them is that they did not get into this industry so that people could cop a buzz. In fact, it's kind of annoying. Uh, there's something in wine that's not really in any other beverage, I think, that is this sense of profundity and speaking soul to soul. We talk about connecting the, the soul of a, of a place, like a vineyard, with the, with the soul of the consumer uh, by rendering its grapes into liquid music. So this, this idea of music uh, is, is, I really think that wine is liquid music. And you know, you should never be a jazz musician unless you have to, and you should never be a winemaker unless you have to, because there's really no money in it. But you know, if I had a billion dollars, I'd just keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, so I consider that I retired when I was 27, because then I got to express uh, my artistic vision with, uh, uh, with people that I, I know by their first names. So what is that vision? Well, uh, I, I am sort of disgusted by what has happened in California wine in the, uh, ever since the uh, Judgment of Paris in 1976. We tried to make bigger and bigger and heavier and oakier and butterier and more alcoholic wines. And I just hate that. 
Uh, you know, I grew up in the 70s when we were making really Eurocentric styles, and I'm trying to show, actually what I'm up to, if you don't find this too arrogant, is uh, I like to, I like to sh demonstrate that California is actually a better place to make Eurocentric wines than Europe is. And so I make all kinds of crazy wines, like I make a Fauche Blee from Napa Valley College's vineyard, and it's very minerally, and it doesn't go in a barrel. In 2005, it's the current vintage, you know, it's the stuff. So it, that demonstrates uh, making a wine that has balance and integrity so that it has great longevity and soulfulness. I, I, I don't make wines to, that climb out of the bottle uh, and try to make you smile. Uh, and I don't make impact wines. You know, I don't, I don't make Disney comedies and I don't make uh, 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 action adventure wines. I, the wines I make kind of make you scratch your head and, and uh, you know, sort of like a Bergman film or something like that, where you, you wonder at first, you know, you're seeing something that you've never seen before. And uh, I really like to stretch your brain. Uh, so uh, the other thing that we really love to do is enable the dreams of small winemakers. There's currently an explosion, like, you know, there's 64 wineries that make all the wine you see on the retail shelf. There are 10,000 little mom and pops just like us that, uh, and, and man, it's, it's a, a lot of work. It's very complex. And so we have a consulting arm that reaches out and currently I have about 120 wineries that I coach uh, on all phases of, of winemaking. That's great. I, that's wonderful that they have, they have you to help them, uh, you know, make it right and, and, and make the best wine they can make. That's the point, right? I really feel for these people. They have pissed away their lives, you know, just for your pleasure just like a jazz musician does. Not trying to get rich and, uh, you know, but man, they work really hard at it. Now, now here's, the, here's the thing that I think is important about that. Uh, one of our values is authenticity and honesty in all our dealings. And that's pretty rare in the wine industry. And I have to say that um, as much as I love what you're doing, Deborah, that some of the people that, are into the natural wine movement are very critical of any sort of actual winemaking. And I just don't think that's right. I think these are artisans and they deserve respect. And the only reason that they would ever lie to you is if you whacked them when they told you the truth. So since I invented some of these winemaking technologies like reverse osmosis and enological oxygen expert, we just thought, that if we just told people the truth, that maybe some of them would like it. Uh, and so that's, that's very important to us. Uh, I also wanna mention that nothing is more important to us than a clean, pleasant, safe work environment that fosters personal growth and development. And uh, you, know, you, should, you should see the way uh, Sandra, my assistant winemaker has blossomed in the four years she's been with us. So uh, if you can't make it happen if you're, if you're not doing that. And you can't make it happen unless there's fun play and ease with freedom to make mistakes. And if you call up Sandra and ask her what I pay her for, she'll say, well, Clark pays me to make mistakes. <laughs> you know, because- Well, they say you, you fail forward, right? <laughs> exactly. And you know, if you're not making any mistakes, you don't belong in my business <laughs> because it's so complex that you just be playing too small and you can't afford it. Well, you can learn, you certainly learn from mistakes and that's sometimes you discover. That's the only way you ever learn. Yeah, I mean, when I teach at Napa Valley College, I just throw them to the wolves. I, I tell them, I'm not gonna support you. I want you to do really bad things here uh, when you're not supporting your family. Right. And, uh, you know, I'll catch you when you fall, but I want you to just screw up uh, so that that's how you learn. Great. You know, Clark, we're about 15 minutes into our, our, our conversation today. Well, you want to taste some wine? Yes, I absolutely do. And I want to go through the 
quick questions, the audit questions that are on the template that I sent you, just to yes. make sure we have that on record, um, on, on the call, on the record, and I'll bring up the questions. So okay. let's taste through the wine and then we'll just address uh, those few questions, okay? Okay, now one, one thing I wanna talk about is our growers. Um, I consider myself to be kind of a, a chef, you know, it's the ultimate slow food, you know, that Fauchibli, I told you about, it took us 40 years to get that vineyard right and then to age the wine. Uh, so it's, but, you know, most chefs don't, they're not farmers. You know, they stay up late at night, they don't get up at four in the morning. And that's really the way we've done it is we've, we've put together very strong relationships for over the decades with, with growers that wake up in the morning thinking about disease pressures and all of the things it takes to make the kind of grapes that I can use, uh, which just take an, an amazing amount of personal care. And I can't do that and do all the other things I'm doing. So uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, three of our vineyards here that are, that are featured today. Uh, I guess I'll get the wine. Yeah, uh, please. So first of all, I want to talk about the Bates Ranch and Prudy Fox. I, I think you know a little about her, uh, Deborah. She's, uh, I don't know if she'd like it for me to say this, but I think of her as the uh, working with these uh, dot-com billionaires in jeans, and she's kind of the, the hippie sage. That, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> yeah, she, but uh, I mean, she's just so talented and, and uh, a lot of the great Pinot Noirs that come out of Santa Cruz Mountains are, uh, are, are her doing as a, as a viticulturist. So um, right down the hill from Ridge Vineyards is the Bates Ranch uh, and they're, uh, uh, they're not a certified vineyard, but man, there's a lot of cover crop there and uh, uh, certainly a sustainable vineyard. Uh, and they're, they're famous for their cabernet. And most people don't know that they make Grenache, but uh, we actually, we make, we make three of them. Uh, let's see here. We make, we make a, a dry Provencal style rosé and we make uh, a red Grenache that, uh, it's got so good, I ended up pouring it at my wedding. But, uh, but we're featuring in this, the sparkling wine. So this is a Method Champenoise. Okay. Sparkling from uh, 2017. Uh, and I, I have to tell you, uh, I think California is a better place to make sparkling wine than Champagne is. I think Champagne tends to be kind of thin and bland and sour. And most of the expression is from the east, but we yeah, have this is true. But they, you know, uh, the climate change is happening there. <laughs> well, they might be getting more flavor now. Uh, but the other problem there is that even the brutes have one and a half percent sugar, and I don't like the way the finish happens when you have a sugar in the finish. So this is a brute zero. Okay. It dosage. It's been through malolactic, uh, and uh, it has a long, long finish. So. Yeah, I, I am taking notes while you talk. So if you see me uh, looking at my keyboard, that's why. So don't be concerned you about got that. A keyboard in the vineyard? Wow, that's amazing. Uh, okay, uh, so you can see that it has this light uh, peach color to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, wonderful effervescence that just lasts forever. Um, the aroma of of course, Grenache, there's strawberries. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then the vineyard characteristic seems to be a ripe honeydew melon. So you've got a lot of fresh fruit in this thing, but it also smells like it's been on the yeast for four or five years. It's, it's actually only uh, a year on the yeast, but because of the malolactic, we get that complexity. So the wine appears to be both young and old, 
at the same time. So there's some autolysis there, some of that nuttiness or some of that creaminess. Yeah, that's right. It's very creamy. It's very rich. And then you just get that long, long finish. And because they have, uh, uh, because of the soils in the Santa Cruz Mountains, I think everybody knows that those wines are, are uh, both distinctive and, uh, and very minerally. And what I mean by that is not the smell of wet stone, but the energy and the finish, which a lot of people think is acidity. And it just gives that, uh, that vibrant energy to the finish. I, I do occasionally describe wines as being vital or energetic. I, yeah, uh -huh. I understand exactly what you mean. A lot of times that's attributed to granite, but- Yes, well, uh, we here's what we found out about. I got a whole chapter in my book about this. And, I do not know what minerality is, not, neither does anybody else. But no we, one knows. Yeah. We see it on, on always on limestone. Do you, yeah. you realize that they grow potatoes 200 yards from Domain Romani Conti because it's not on the, on the limestone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. If they could grow Pinot there, they'd do it, believe me. Okay. Uh, and and, and uh, you always see it in Portuguese ports because of the schist. And you yes. see it on the Mosul because of the slate. So well, the rot, you know, the, the yeah. yeah. We mostly have decomposed granite in California, and I'm always looking for vineyards that, that will give that. But the other thing we found, this is, this is the faux chablis, is that uh, Claude Bourguignon told us, well, you can get minerality on any soil if you just uh, knock it off with the pesticides and herbicides and, and get the weeds going. And yeah. then Cultivate the bio microbiome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Get a soil, soil food web, especially earthworms. They work cheap, and then uh, that that will foster the growth of mycorrhizal fungi, and that's where the mineral yeah. is from. Right? Absolutely. Um, okay. Does your sparkling brew have a fantasy name other than sparkling brew? It is called Sparkling Grenache Santa Cruz Mountain Blanc de Noir Brut Zero. Okay, thank you, Grenache. Brute zero. Okay, perfect. I think the story is weird enough already without. Confusing. Okay, all right. So wine number two. Wine number two. Yeah, wine number two, and this one is still in barrel. I am so stoked about this wine. Now, this is a guy named Ibo Tejada, uh, and he's got a vineyard uh, in Lake County. In, in yes, love Lake County. Yeah, West Lake County. It's. It's right when you're coming up from Ukiah and you go through this pass and there's this long lake called Blue Lake. Yes, I know Blue Lake. You know, and there's a bar right there. Yeah, and you yeah. Go past that and look to your right and this is where this vineyard is nestled in this mountain valley and there's a waterfall there. Uh, Ebo is a he's, a, he's a contractor and, and he loves to build things and and so he's got this huge ranch house that he's built stuff we go up to and party. But more to the point, he just, he said, I'm not going to do this at all unless I'm all organic on everything. It's mostly Grenache and Tempranillo. And, Is uh, he certified? No, I don't, I don't think he wants to bother. Yeah. And, you know, certification causes you to do a lot of stupid things. So most of the people that are really into it, uh, they just go, look, I'm just going to do what I believe. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm, and, and I'm, I'm the same way. I, I love a living soil. I really won't buy anything that isn't off of living soil, but the certification, to me, the whole process is kind of disgusting. Uh, okay. Well, let's talk about the wine because that's what I really want to know about. So yeah. just look at this stuff. This is a 2019. We're going to bottle it in December. Uh-huh. It's just loaded with cherries. It has this sweet core of fruit to it. Just very round and rich. And, and there's that mineral energy. In, in the finish as well. I don't own any barrels that are less than 20 years old. So this is not an oaky wine. It's just jam packed with fruit and it's not, it's not jammy either. It's not. Right. So what's the alcohol here? It's 13.7. Oh, okay. Well, that's another thing about my wines is they're, uh, they're really not, uh, almost never over 14 and some of them are as low as 11. 
Oh, that's that's so wonderful. So this wine is simply called the uh, Tempranillo. It's, it's going to be Tejada Vineyard 2019 Tempranillo. All right, Tempranillo. And, and is it all? Is it 100 percent? 100 percent temp. 100 percent temp. 100 percent. All right. I had Grenache. I had uh, Grenache in there. So okay. All right. Great. Yum. Okay. So then, now this is really something. Uh, there are, there's a family in Northern Humboldt. So this is like six hours north of where I am in Santa Rosa, uh -huh. just near the Trinity border in a little town called Hoopa. Hoopa. And uh, the Pierces grow a lot of organic produce and, uh, and they have all the meritage varieties there. And uh, I think they may have some other profitable vegetable crops there too. Uh, but anyway, uh, I just have never seen a vineyard like this. This is a Meritage. It has all five varieties in it. All five. Wow. Uh, well, I should mention that in, uh, uh, hey, sweetie, could you, could you bring me that book there, God's Men and Wine? I got, uh, I got handed this book. Uh, okay, right? It's in the middle shelf, right in the middle, God's Men and Wine. Um, and I got handed this book in 2001 that uh, where the author William uh, uh, William Younger that's that's I don't know if you can see that okay God's Men and Wine and he shows that the Romans didn't use sulfites at all for a thousand years all over Europe they had them they used them for other things but they didn't like what it did to wine and so I thought well that's crazy. So I decided to start doing it. Originally, I was doing the Renaissance Syrahs to mix. And so we called them Roman Syrah. And the reason is, I don't want to make a big deal about, I'm, I'm not saying the sulfite-free wines are necessarily good for you. Uh, you know, there's some arguments that they have some biogenic amines in them and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, but we know, we already know that Saccharomyces is giving us uh, 100 milligrams per liter of, you know, we're getting some well, natural well, ten, sulfur. But, okay, so the way I set up a wine like this to age well is to use oxygen early on to build the structure. And that I know. <laughs> I don't apologize for it, and there's a whole bunch of chapters in my book about how. Yeah, we, yeah. It's basically the tannin is like the egg whites when you make a souffle, and the oxygen is like a wire whisk, and the yeast it's kind of like the egg yolks that you fold in at the end. That's basically it. And it's what the Belgians learned from the Spanish, learned from the Aztecs, how to make, you know, cocoa powder into chocolate. It's the same thing. So it is a, it is a cooking technique and I don't apologize for it. I'm very proud of what I did. So anyway, we do that. We don't add any SO2, all organic. Uh, we build a structure that has a lot of integrity, um, and it actually it sounds weird, but it actually increases the wine's appetite for oxygen. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then we just put it in an old barrel uh, for uh, four, four or five years. Extended aging. Yeah, 57 months. Now, I've decanted this stuff because even now, uh, this is the thing nobody knows, is that SO2 doesn't protect the wine to make it age better. And in fact, it drops the wine's ap oxygen appetite by about a factor of 12. So the sulfite-free wines, you, know, you don't have oxidation problems, at least in the reds, but you will have reduction problems. And so a well-made sulfite-free wine you want to decan it, maybe even let it sit around for a day or two. Uh, so what do we got here? Just, first of all, there's this feeling of falling, like pressing the down button in an elevator. And that's what you get when you put your nose in this thing. Well, the wine looks completely opaque. It looks very it dark. It's very, very dense. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can't use the aroma wheel on a wine like this. It's it's just 
what you said, profundity. Uh, right. Is it tangy? Right. Does it have that tanginess we associate sometimes with wines that that really haven't, you know, been sulfur? Um, are you talking about the nose? You know, it's that it's that feel. Well, it could be. You could sense it on the nose, but more on the palate. The feeling on the palate of a little tang. Uh, like you're little probably stick. talking about acetic acid. Well, I am below below the threshold of perception of overt acetic acid, but well, this is this is very low, acid, but it does have a ton of minerality back there, which you it's in the same place. Okay. It's sour, uh, and I don't know. I think it's one of the best wines I've ever made. And because it's in Northern Humboldt County, I didn't have to pay a whole lot for the grapes. Uh, and so then you could age it as long as you did. Um, tell me a little yeah. bit more about the flavor profile. You told me it's a Meritage with all five varieties. So I'm yes. assuming, is, it, is there any one variety that's dominant here? Is it, do you, is it really communicating Cabernet or is it more about Petit Bordeaux? The, the Merlot is the, is the predominant. Merlot, all right. And we have about... Uh, I think it's, I have to look it up, but I think it's about 60%. Okay. Uh, and then most of the rest of the, I think there's 19 cab and 14 PV and just a little smattering of, of cab franc and, and Malbec. Now you'd okay. think it had a lot of Malbec in it because it's just loaded with red fruit. Yeah, I'm like, wow, it's got to be very Malbec-y or PV. So it has... Cab Sauv, a Merlot dominant Cab Sauv, Cab Franc, Mal Malbec, and PV. But this Malbec is, uh, I I'm sorry, this, this, this Merlot is not like your typical downstream California Merlot. It has no veg to it at all, mm -hmm. and it's loaded with grenadine. And so I, you know, that and the other, you know, black cherry from the Cabernet, Cinnamon and and, uh, and and white cherry from the cab front. Okay, Those so Clark, I, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt, but I don't have a, a, too much of a choice here. I need to make sure that I get the retail prices for each of these wines, if you don't mind. Oh sure. Yeah. Oh sure. Uh, the uh, sparkling is sixty. Okay. Uh, Tempranillo will be forty. Okay. And the uh, and and the the. Uh, Humboldt Meritage is, is 60. 60. Oh, super. And you've told me a lot about the vineyards. I feel really comfortable with that, knowing that I that I have a the, the lowdown on the vineyards here. Let's just make sure that I've cut and you've given me case production. Uh, acres under vine, that there well, that doesn't apply. So right. So um, yeah, zero. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> and many uh, many of the soul wine producers are. So Certifications, none of the producers are certified in any way. So that, I just want to just get that on the Well, record, so. there's a rumor going around that the Pierce Vineyard is certified, but. I can check. There, okay. It's called Ishipishi. Oh, yes. It's the road that goes past the vineyard. Uh, we've been trying to get a hold of those guys to get our hands on their certification. All I right. I have All one, right. but. It's a six hour drive to knock on their door and they're, they're, they're really not very tech savvy. So. Well, if you can't get a hold of them, it's not likely I can get a hold of them. So I might have to. That'd be great. <laughs> All right. Well, I think we, I think we covered most of the information that I need here. And what's going to happen is I'm going to be sending you a fact check of the guide entry. Um, mm -hmm. And I will do that and give you, you know, at least a week or two to look at it and get back to me with any comments or adjustments that need to be made. We want to be very factual. And I certainly have a link to a digital copy of the 2020 guide if you want to see that, if you didn't pick one up at the tasting because you were there. I've got one. You've got one. Okay, good. So, um, so that'll be next steps. You'll get a fact check from me. And once I get that back from mm -hmm. you, um, then you'll be official. Well, it's a great honor. Thank you, Thank you. For, uh, for giving us some uh, exposure. Well, it's our pleasure. We're really happy to have you be part of the Slow Wine family. Thank you. Okay, no. yep. Ciao.